Hello, welcome to this really special episode of the India Story. Over the next one hour, we are going to take a really in-depth look and a deep dissection of Prime Minister Narendra Modi's historic American visit. We've seen a lot happening in the last couple of days and we're going to have all the top experts joining us here in the studio over the next one hour to fully understand the implications. Indrani Bakshi is with us right now. She, she's, she's one of the top writers on uh, foreign affairs for a long time and the CEO of the Ananta Aspen Center. Mr. M.K. Padra Kumar joining us, former diplomat. He's been serving in a lot of these areas. A range of guests are, going, are joining us. Dhruva Jay Shankar uh, is joining us, executive director of ORF. Is, uh, is with us as well. Uh, Dhruva Jashankar, thank you so much for being with us. Arun Kumar Singh, Michael Kugelman, RKS Bhadoria, Arzan Tarpura, they're all going to be with us in just a, a short while. But before I come to any of the guests to try and get their uh, implications, their understanding of all that's happened, let's just try and uh, quickly sum it up. Those are some of the guests we've got uh, coming up for you a little later. Well, let's just, kind of, let's just take a look now at some of the big takeaways. How is this one week going to be actually remembered? Well, there are three or four aspects to it. Number one, the atmospherics, the body language, the pageantry, the, the thickness of the red carpet, if you like, that was rolled out. Now, all of those off the scales, I don't think there's ever been an, been an Indian leader quite welcomed in that manner. The White House was thrown open, uh, Indian Americans thronging the White House, a state dinner, a very lavish state dinner, a address uh, to uh, Congress, the second time that the, the Prime Minister was speaking out there. The atmospherics were great, couldn't have been better. The second thing that we're going to be looking at is the substantive business that was actually done. Atmospherics are great, but was any work done? And yes, once again, the answer has to be emphatically, yes, it was done. There were key agreements in defense, for example, co-production, tech transfer to the GE 414 jet engines, the procurement of those uh, Predator uh, drones, the Sea Guardian and, and, and the Sky Guardian drones, semiconductors, Micron Tech is going to be investing, uh, you know, for, for the creation of uh, semiconductor plants out there. That's going to be lots of jobs coming up there as well and major technology transfer, applied materials. We'll be setting up a center as well. There was talk about activity in quantum computing. A lot of this perhaps had been mentioned earlier. It had been discussed in the press earlier. But there were a couple of surprises as well. Take a look at space, for example. The fact that there's going to be cooperation between NASA and ISRO, joint mission to, to uh, the space station, and then India signing the Artemis Accords. That could have a major, major impact. So business, a lot of business was done and we're going to take a look at all of that. But there were some discordant notes also, which we, I mean, if it's a grand symphony that was playing out, there were a couple of discordant notes as well. Somebody sort of throwing trumpets or trombones out of the orchestra pit, uh, a, a, as it were. Some of them perhaps were to be expected that the press would, that the, that the Western media would say X, Y, and Z. And we, and there was perhaps expected that Ilhan Omar and others, they were going to be boycotting that. Um, the fact that Barack Obama came out with a statement, that perhaps was a bit of a surprise, that interview and the timing of it, and we should discuss it. And then, of course, the entire question of democracy did come up, the Prime Minister directly taking a question on that at the press conference and answering it. So, a couple of discordant notes, but then let's discuss what the big uh, themes out here were. Dhruvajay Shankar is with us, Michael Googleman with us, as I said, Indrani Bakchi here, and MK Bhadra Kumar as well. Dhruvajay Shankar, why don't I start with you? Uh, I, I spelt out the sort of brand, broad landscape of all that we could at least see sitting out here and analyzing it. Do you think that was a, a, a fair summary? What would be the main things that you would pick on uh, of what happened in the last couple of days? Thank you, Vikram. Uh, I, no, I, I think you touched upon all the, the major issues. I think the most remarkable uh, two aspects of it uh, were, you know, beyond the pomp and ceremony, uh, were one, the breadth of the relationship was really showcased. And, you know, whether it is strategic partnerships, the, you know, the U.S. bringing India into international organizations, India bringing the U.S. into Indian-led international organizations, uh, joint collaboration in third countries, the defense relationship, whether it's economic and trade, and again, beyond the nice, happy talk, there were some actual deals signed, uh, creating jobs and opportunity in both countries. Um, and again, in the U.S., there tends to be a, a, sometimes an emphasis on a, a belief that this is a one-way relationship, but I think there was plenty to show uh, Indian uh, companies contributing in meaningful ways to the U.S. economy in, as well. 
um, on te the technology partnership, I think, was really showcased. And finally, the people-to-people -people relationship. So this was a really broad relationship. And then, the, as you mentioned, the depth. I think you know, the, again, uh, the, the, we've had we've had nice joint statements before, but this is one that actually uh, uh, had very concrete outcomes. You know, specific agencies and the two governments working together on discrete outcomes. Uh, companies working together, public-private partnerships, uh, specific scholarships for students to come, you know, you know, visa regimes, things like that. So I think the, the, that fine-grained um, detail was was uh, welcome and encouraging to see. All right, Mike, Michael Coogan, uh, let's get the headlines. And I do want to dive into uh, all the things that we, had, we have been talking about and dissect them in some detail. But the broad headlines that you would pick up from what you saw, along expected lines, better than expectation, worse than expectation. How would you interpret it? Well, you know, I, I, one of the features of U.S.-India relations, uh, as it's enjoyed uh, exponential growth over the last few decades, is that, uh, you know, the rhetoric and the messaging around it uh, tends to be very positive, oftentimes soaring, which sometimes sets expectations that aren't met at high-level summits like this. But I think this one, which of course was was a state visit, the expectations really were met. Uh, you had a number of big deals that went through, including uh, several that had been discussed for quite some time but had not been consummated. And you look at the, the drones deal uh, for as, a, as an example of that. But you know, I think the big headlines may be what ultimately isn't the most important uh, outcome of the, of the summit, but certainly the drones deal, the engines deal, um, you know, the Micron deal, those are big ticket headlines. But for me, I think what stands out the most, I think reflecting what, what Dhruva said, is how this relationship has become much more multifaceted over relatively uh, little periods of, uh, of, of time. The fact that you now have you know, higher education, space, uh, tech, uh, and so many areas outside of geopolitics, for example, that have become big areas of, of cooperation. I think that was what was celebrated, one of the things that was celebrated um, at this summit. But, you know, for now, the big question is, what comes next? Implementation, follow-on, uh, will the soaring momentum that you have now be maintained? And particularly in the coming months, as both countries, both governments start to focus on, on their election campaigns and so on. And that's where I think the people-to-people, non-government aspects of this relationship are critical. You look to the business leaders, to the, um, to the, uh, the academics, the investors, the others to, to drive the relationship forward. Right. Uh, Arun Singh, former, former Indian ambassador to the U.S., you, you know the, the, the history of the relationship. It has often been said that there are these grand gestures in India and America and natural allies and we're going to work together and there's a lot that we're going to do together to, to change the world, but nothing actually gets done. Um, I think as Michael was, was, was saying and Dhruva was saying as well, this time a fair amount was actually delivered on the ground in terms of technology, in terms of how we're going to cooperate in defense, how we're going to cooperate in space, and of course those actual deals, the co-production of defense uh, 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 no, items like, like engines, the fact that that involves technology transfer. So was there something to actually catch on to and, and bite in, in, in concrete terms this time around? No, absolutely, Vikram. And I think uh, a lot has been delivered in concrete terms. And that's because of the work that has gone on in the background. Uh, you'd recall that in January this year, the two national security advisors launched the initiative on critical and emerging technologies where spoke of artificial intelligence quantum cyber 6g biotech semiconductors defense and the message was that from the national security perspective they believe that the two countries should partner in these technologies and that was the message to different government departments message to business message to the academia in both countries and so today for example if the g deal has gone through it is because of this new initiative in critical and emerging technologies because that's created a certain ecosystem for approvals. Because again, from the reports that have been coming out, there was resistance within the US system for, for allowing this kind of technology transfer. And the from what I hear, you know, basically the National Security Council, the White House, the president sent the message that they want this to be done because they want to take the partnership with India to higher levels. Now, once that has started, then the whole host of other things uh, come in. Uh, for example, this uh, announcement that the US Department of Defense Space Force has yeah. agreed to do, do a collaboration with two Indian startups. Uh, now, that's again something very, very new. So right. a lot has started. 
Right, Dhruva Jay Shankar, I know, I know you have to leave us in three or four minutes. I'm just going to get in a couple of questions to you before, before continuing with the others. One of the basic things that I think has often been debated ad nauseum when it comes to India-American relations, and there's been a lot of chat about it in the last few days and weeks as well, what's the nature of the partnership? Well, we're clearly not traditional allies. Is that good or is that bad? This is that, that conversation is taking place in America. Some people will say it's good that India is not actually an ally. It means we don't have to look after them. We can actually get India to, to pull its weight and to be partners partners but not allies, shared interests or shared values. That debate has been taking place for a while. Has it finally been settled one way or the other or no? Uh, no, I'm afraid it, it hasn't because I think that debate takes place in a vacuum. It takes place amongst academics and think tank people and people in the media who frankly should know better. Um, the reality, I think, is the governments are quite clear on this score, which is the U.S. is not offering India an alliance and India is not seeking an alliance with the United States. And they're both quite clear about that. I think that in some ways it's a very pedantic type of argument. Ultimately, it you know this is a partnership that is getting deeper. Uh, it is a par partnership that is mutually beneficial. I mean, arguably, and I think they they said this. This is a partnership that is vital for both countries. If the U.S. wants to compete in a more um, uh, uh, in a in a world where power is more diffused, where they have a major peer competitor with in in, in the form of China. Uh, there is no way that they can keep their scientific and technological and economic edge without a, a, a positive, constructive partnership with India. And equally, if India is to rise as uh, in a multipolar world, there is almost no way that it can do so without uh, a, a constructive partnership with the United States. And that, in, in, you know, whether it's with market access or investment or technological cooperation or security. Now, this is the reality that has sunk in in both systems. And I think they they have been working very constructively to uh, forge that kind of mutually beneficial partnership. Um, but I do, th I, you know, I, my, my, I think that will continue. And, and I think all, all the signs are that that's in a positive direction. But again, I think we're, we're going to be in another cycle, a slightly useless cycle of uh, discussions and nitpicking by, uh, by members of the media and frankly, fellow members of my, uh, the think tank community in both countries who will be going on on this debate that is, that is increasingly irrelevant. Right. And on that note, there's also been a lot of chatter. It's all to do with China. Is it all to do with China? Or at the end of the day, the next 30, 40 years, China or no China? This is a relationship that has to be sorted out, that has to work. And there's more, more uh, indicating that interests and values are likely to be aligned than the opposite. And therefore, this is a natural partnership to that point. China or no China? I mean, look, in some ways, there's no getting around the fact that China's rise has been the major transformative uh, geopolitical and geoeconomic event of our times. It is, it is a reality. Um, it, is, it is now you know, 20 to 25 percent of the global economy. It is a manufacturing powerhouse. And, this, and the fact that both India and the United States are engaged in a, in a deep strategic, long-term strategic competition with China, barring major changes in the Chinese Communist Party's world outlook, means that there will be a natural... Uh, a response by that on the part of both India and the United States. And in many areas, not all, in many areas that would mean uh, naturally more conducive uh, conditions for a partnership between India and the US. But uh, so there's no question that China is a driver. I mean, um, uh, if, if China was not doing certain things, clearly there would not be the impetus on both sides uh, for to, to construct a, a, a deeper partnership. That being said, uh, there's also plenty, uh, you know, given the breadth of the India-US relationship, there are plenty of areas where China is not as much of a factor. There is a strong people-to-people -people exchange. Uh, people are not, you know, Indian Americans are not coming here and thriving in the US because of China. It is, it is happening because of a, a strong link between India and the US. So I think, uh, again, you can, the answer is a bit of both. You can't get around the fact that China is uh, increasingly a driver of the relationship, but uh, I don't think that that, it's, that alone should be defining the, the positive and constructive agenda that the two countries are, are, are putting together. All right, Dhruv Jay Shankar, Executive Director of RF America, thank you so much for joining us uh, with that perspective. Indrani, let me get you in on this. I sort of atmospherics, you, you, you've been there, you've been for many of these. Is that as good as you got? And the deal making, was that as good as it gets? The deal making certainly is better than it gets. Uh, I think uh, some of the, uh, if you look at some of the deals that have been signed, um, they're quite extraordinary, especially in the technology, in the innovation space, um, even in the in the uh, in, in the clean energy space. And you look at Indian companies 
uh, investing in the US as part of the IRA, um, which is Biden's gr biggest uh, sort of legislative uh, deal that he did last year. Uh, and all this time, India and a number of European countries have said the IRA is an extremely uh, protectionist move. But Indian companies are investing under the IRA in the US, and that is a big statement. So that's an important, uh, I think that's an important part. Certainly, right. in, yeah. Uh, le le on that note, let me just throw that back to Michael, Michael Kugelman. Uh, uh, Michael, th there's been obviously some pressure on, 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 on Biden, uh, including from his own party, in fact, mainly from his own party. You've gone too far. Why did you roll out such a, such a massive red carpet? You know, you're bending over backwards. I've, I've heard those things said. The fact that there was a lot of concrete business done, and business that is obviously of direct benefit to both to both uh, countries. I mean, we heard uh, Joe Biden specifically referring to the million jobs that could be created thanks to uh, Indian aircraft uh, uh, orders. Is that something which is which gives him and everyone else in the American administration uh, something to hold out to and saying, look, they are concrete businesses now. We're doing business with India with what we are doing. Well, yes, I, I think so. Um, you know, I think we should also uh, acknowledge that President Biden himself has long been a very strong advocate for a deep U.S.-India partnership. You know, consistently in what he said and written, uh, going back to when he was a senator and certainly when he was a vice president, always been a big booster of, uh, of U.S.-India relations. So I think that uh, some of the, the pressure um, coming, well, not, I wouldn't want to say pressure, but some of the comments coming from some within his own party, whether you're talking about uh, members of Congress or in terms of President Obama's uh, uh, or Barack Obama's remarks yesterday, I, I, I don't think that, I don't think we should overstate the significance of all of that. And indeed, yes, I mean, we have all these new business deals, we all have all kinds of other deals. I think that accentuates the fact that you know, it's really a sideshow. Uh, this, you know, this focus on the the values-based uh, uh, aspects of the relationship. Yeah, I mean, it's it's important from a U.S. perspective to some extent, especially because the relationship has long defined itself through values, and we heard that expressed by both leaders uh, yesterday. But you know, at the end of the day, this is a relationship that's driven by strategic imperatives, by person to pers personal the person uh, ties by trust, by goodwill, and by a desire to forge and maintain a long-term partnership. And right. so that's why I don't think that these concerns from, you know, from some critics is going to have that, that big of an impact on Michael, the relationship. Were you, were you, I mean, some of the criticism, okay, Bernie Sanders and the squad coming out and saying that we, are, we, you know, we don't like this, we're going to boycotting is one thing. Were you surprised that Barack Obama would make that comment in an interview uh, with this particular timing? As a, as a former president? Or was it just a coincidence? Right. Yeah, I mean, uh, well, I, I'd like to think it was a coincidence. Obviously, I, I don't know. But, you know, let's keep in mind that, Pre that Barack Obama said something very similar in 2015 when he gave that speech um, in New Delhi. Uh, you know, he, he, it was something that we all remember <laughs> even now. So that suggests that what he said in the interview on CNN may have reflected views that he has had for quite a few years. And he didn't just happen to bring it up now to try to undermine President Biden when, when uh, Prime Minister Modi was, was in town. But let me just say this as well. You know, you mentioned Bernie Sanders. You know, there were several members of Congress that decided to boycott the, uh, the Modi joint address. This is a very small number of folks, right? You look at the hundreds of, of members of Congress. We're talking about five or six that have been critical and boycotted the uh, the address. And you know, we're talking about not only a small number of folks, but also people that don't set policy on India. They don't set foreign policy on the whole. So I think it's important to separate the criticism from the legislative branch, and in this case from an ex-president, from the actual executive uh, branch of the government, which drives the policy, and in my view, even though it may be concerned about some of the things playing out in India internally, are fully committed, uh, fully committed to um, to pushing the accelerator on this relationship. And I hear in my own private conversations with U.S. officials these days, and really over the last few months, an emphasis on this idea of taking things to a new phase. I keep hearing that 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 um, that uh, that phrase, and I think that suggests just how much of a desire there is to really push things forward. Right, that's that's interesting. Let me just get Mr. Mr. Bhadra Kumar in. You know, it's interesting when we are talking about what actually happened uh, and where there were dissonant noises. You, you've of course served in in Russia. You've taken a close look at that. 
not that much dissonance, at least publicly, not even harsh comments or questions being asked and all that about India's relationship with Russia. Is that now something, therefore, that is, that is water under the bridge? It's accepted that India has its own position on that. India is not going to shift that position. Let's accept that and move on. You see, this is, uh, this is the known unknown here. Uh, what is obvious is that uh, Russia didn't really figure as a contentious issue during this visit. Uh, you know, there is uh, no attention at all, in fact, on India's stance on Ukraine. I, I, I didn't see at least. And in closed door meetings, closed door discussions, there definitely would have been. Mentioned tangentially yes, while talking yes, to yes. the. To, to on the, Congress, the whole, on not the, an era of war, yeah. with the, those statements. On the taken. whole, uh, the, um, uh, I think President Biden's remarks on Ukraine were uh, also very moderate. You know, I mean, he didn't say anything, uh, you know, in a way to uh, condemn Russia in the way that he does usually. I think he was very restrained. So you, you can imagine that, you know, that Russia is not a factor there. Now that is paradoxically the most troublesome element here because Russia is going to be a factor. And in fact, the, uh, the war has uh, reached a tipping point. And now what happens is uh, everyone is holding breath. It could be, you know, a direct confrontation between Russia and the United States, Russia and NATO. It could be that way. There is, uh, again, renewed talk of uh, use of nuclear weapons, tactical weapons. So that becomes so, a wild card. Which yeah, could it is, a, it is a wild card. And therefore, uh, when we speak about the atmospherics and so on, there is going to be a very big challenge for Indian foreign policy and diplomacy. Uh, uh, we will be called upon to take a stance so the feel good that has been generated here can also dissipate very fast because okay. that is for the American foreign policy today, that is at the center stage, the, 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 the world order, you know. All right. I'm, I'm just going to throw that to uh, uh, Ambassador Arun Singh and also um, uh, former chief of Air Staff RKS Badoria is joining us. So I'm going to be asking him about the GE deal and some of the other uh, concrete things that we've, we've just see, seen uh, announced. But just before I come to that, Indrani, one of the things you must be so delighted, not mentioned, didn't come up. You remember all former summits used to be largely about the P word, Pakistan, what's happening with Pakistan, Pakistan AIDS, Pakistan by wasn't mentioned and no one expected it to be mentioned, which is also rather heartening. No yes, sign of it anywhere. Yeah, no, it wasn't mentioned. And not even a shadow, not even the ghost. No. Of no. The but P word anywhere. No, nowhere. Uh, and uh, I mean I know that there was some uh, discussion on terrorism, but there was definitely no discussion on thank, Pakistan. And thank heavens, is, thank heavens, you moved on, we moved on from, from that particular thing. Well, um, even his uh, comments on Ukraine, I mean, he's, he emphasized territorial sovereignty and integrity, and that is territorial integrity and sovereignty, and that is, that is it. He did not go beyond that. All right. Um, uh, Ambassador, uh, I don't think you've heard, you've heard some of these comments. Before I come to the specifics of the defense deal, for example, um, your sense of what is likely to happen in the next few months, in the next few years. There are obviously lots of positives to be, to be building on in the next few months. Um, uh, uh, Mr. Bhadra Kumar said there could be that Russia question shouldn't be buried entirely. Could that come up? Election campaigns are going to be happening. Um, could, you know, the democracy questions again come up and uh, uh, the domestic criticism that we've seen in America from sections of the Democratic Party, could that come up? Or are things going to be fairly smooth, you think, from here on? So I think, uh, Vikram, as we discussed, a lot of major decisions have been taken. Now it's a question of implementing them. Uh, I have found, uh, based on my experience in India-U.S. relations, uh, that it is important to sustain high-level attention on taking the relationship forward. Because, of course, now we've reached another level. This visit is being uh, described as transformational. Still a new relationship. Really started, this phase started in 2000. So if this high level attention is not sustained, it does run into problems. And it happened, for example, in 2012-13, uh, because after the civil nuclear agreement, after Prime Minister Manmohan Singh's visit in 2009 for a state visit, uh, President Obama's visit in 2010, uh, when he declared support for India's permanent membership of UN Security Council, at the high level, uh, at the top level, attention veered off. 
the government in India uh, was having difficulties on its own. Uh, there was a lot of focus, for example, at that time on the, um, the MMRCA deal, an expectation that perhaps U.S. may have a role there. And, and that didn't work out very well. So with all that uh, high-level attention faded off, and suddenly the critics of the relationship, including in Congress and elsewhere, they became stronger. Okay. Now, we have to ensure that uh, as we are now entering the election cycle in India and the election cycle in the U.S., that at the high level, an attention remains on the relationship. Uh, otherwise, the challenges could start again. So the good thing here is that uh, President Biden is likely to be coming here for the G20 summit in September. Right. Uh, there will be a Quad summit in 2024, although dates are not indicated. But the summit will be hosted by India. And the U.S. president will be coming for that. So these two events will be action-forcing events. And they will force the two systems, the two establishments, to try and make progress uh, on whatever has been worked out at this stage. And that will sustain right. the relationship. So I think we should so watch high that. Level, high-level summitry would be one of the things. The other thing, perhaps, would be this time, unlike after the nuclear deal, where there was a long period when nothing was done, no, no actual nuclear plants were set up out here by the Americans, which caused American companies to have some heartburn. This time, there are some specific deals being done. And let me just get in. Uh, former Chief of Air Staff, RKS Badoria, in on that question. Uh, sir, the Air Force, uh, I, I just want to get your a sense of the deals that have just been done. The drone deal seems massive. The GE engine deal. The fact that HAL can now have that technology to power not just the Tejas Mark II, but potentially all the other aircraft that it is planning to roll out, co-production, transfer of technology. Do you think this is transformative? And do you think this, as to the Air Force would be delighted right now with what could come in the next few years? Oh, absolutely transformative and, uh, and very, very critical for the uh, state we are presently in, in terms of our aviation ecosystem and developing unknown fighters. And also, as far as uh, uh, drone is concerned, the critical gap that we currently have in, in our ability for 24-7 monitoring surveillance and reconnaissance, be it for intelligence or for, you know, uh, continuous surveillance in our areas of concern or areas of interest, both on the land borders and over maritime. So, so these two uh, were critical aspects. And I think from that angle, it is really transformative. Uh, G, particularly so from uh, the point of manufacturing setup, the engine will give us a complete ecosystem in engine manufacturing. And uh, uh, Predator, of course, uh, uh, towards uh, capability uh, building and getting that critical gap filled. Um, how do you also see the, the talk that is happening on space and the Artemis uh, uh, Accords? Does that... That's, that's future technology. That's a direction in which things might move. I'm sure the Air Force has had its eye in space also at some point or the other. Uh, do you think that's also transformative? Oh, for a long time, we've had our eyes from the beginning on space. And uh, uh, it is really critical. Uh, uh, our our uh, interactions that have happened and what has been decided in terms of space, in terms of cyber, and in terms of some of the other technologies that is being talked about, uh, be it uh, AI, quantum, you know, uh, interaction at research level, uh, joint projects, uh, be it uh, high power computers, these are the areas for the future. And uh, cyberspace and space capability itself, I think, is critical for the future. So developments in this field are equally important, and in some respects, I would say, more important for the future. And from Air Force perspective, again, uh, and for the defense services, entire right. defense service perspective, would really, be uh, important, very, very uh, critical for our future. Right. And one, one last question, uh, uh, Mr. Badoria, as, as the former chief of air staff, you must have been evaluating the drones, and these are not these are not cheap drones. These are expensive drones. You must have said, should we be buying these Sea Guardians and Sky Guardians and Predators? Uh, cost nearly as much as a fighter jet. Think this is the right call, and these are really important uh, advanced technologies that can be used, not just in the seas, but also by the Air Force and by the Army. Oh yes, cost was was uh, really an issue, one of the issues that when we uh, dealt with this and when we were evaluating. Also, we wanted to uh, give a uh, Philip and a chance for our own indigenous industry. DRD was doing a lot of work, uh, but 
the gap that existed and the pace at which indigenous development was taking place, especially in the range of sensors, you need, uh, you know, high altitude, you need to look uh, at depth, you need to be uh, sustain your uh, drone there for a longer duration. So 30 plus hours, you know, at very high altitude, you look deep inside. Those were critical areas and the kind of sensors this has. So from that aspect, this uh, limited induction, I think, is absolutely the right step uh, right. Uh, from point of view of its requirement and the capability jump it will give to the forces. All right, former Chief of Air Staff, uh, Arkes Badoria, uh, thank you so much for joining us. You've helped us understand the importance of those, uh, those specific deals. Michael Kugelman, let me just come back to you. There was an there was entire generations of technology denial. It was the one of the basis on, on on what a lot of the discussions were taking place ten years ago, fifteen years ago. With all that's happened right now, is the question of technology denial or the possibility of technology denial now firmly in the past? Because the U.S. clearly seems to be doing things with India that it doesn't even do with the closest of allies. Right, absolutely. And that gets to what was said earlier about how it's important not to overstate the, the notion of the, the necessity of an alliance to make a relationship, to make a security partnership really work. And indeed, yeah, I mean, that's why that's why this jet engine deal is so critical. Uh, you're talking about an 80% technology transfer. And indeed, you're right, unprecedented for U.S.-India relations, and I think unprecedented for the U.S. and any of its uh, relations across the board. But look, I mean, clearly, you know, something clicked over the last few months, right? And I think we've been discussing and how there's, there's always for quite some time been discussions about the need to focus on dealing with constraints that have that have uh, hampered greater levels of technology transfers. But things haven't moved forward, whether it's because of bureaucratic concerns or policy issues or whatever the case may be. But you know, I think that you could look to several milestones, certainly ISET being one of those. Uh, you know, the fact that you have this major new initiative focused on strengthening uh, cooperation on technology that's led by the uh, national security advisors in each country, that's so critical because that has the capacity to keep the bureaucracy at bay, uh, so to speak, in both countries and uh, allowing there to be the types of forward movement on moving past these denials of, of technology uh, transfers, whatever the, uh, the case may be. So, yeah, and that's not to say that you know, there, there's still a long way to go. I mean, these export control issues continue to loom large, but I think what's important here is that there are now formal mechanisms in place such as I said, as well as this relatively new strategic trade dialogue that was just launched, at which you're going to have you know, frequent regular engagements on high levels to, to work through these, these lingering questions and concerns Wait. about export controls that have hit you, know, you, you, you said things have started to change in the last few months, and there's been dramatic progress, which there has. And there's a logic to it also, which we've heard Elbridge Colby and, I, and others, for example, writing about quite extensively, that it's one thing for the Americans to have allies, allies whom America has to look after. So therefore, America has to take the security burden, pay for it, and say, okay, how are we going to shield ally A or ally B or ally C? With India, it could be different. You can actually have a partner who can take care of itself and take care of security in this part of the Indian Ocean, provided it has helped to build its capability up to do that. Do you think that's the sort of light bulb that has gone off somewhere, and that's why a lot of these things are really, really moving quite fast? Yeah, I, I think so. Uh, that's certainly certainly part of it, and uh, you know, you, you I think also just the realization that uh, you know alliances uh, are are not necessary to to make headway. I don't think either of these countries expect to sign mutual defense pacts or fight wars alongside each other. That's not what this relationship is all about. Um, and uh, you know, certainly, you know, the U.S. has has had longtime allies that have uh, led to major uh, problems in relations. You know, the U.S. has ally has alliances with Pakistan, with Turkey, Saudi Arabia, a number of countries that haven't really worked out well. Uh, whereas with India, it's not an alliance, but things are moving forward in a big way. And just look at how things are going. I mean, you now have this new uh, one of the many things announced yesterday at the, in the joint statement is a new Indian Ocean dialogue. Right. There's been long been, in my view, a need for the two countries to folk, to establish formal mechanisms that can allow them to focus more on the threat posed by China in areas closer to India's neighborhood. We all know that the U.S. and India are cooperating in the Pacific Ocean through their membership in the Indo-Pacific Quad. But I think it's time to have something a bit more formal um, and mechanized to address Indian Ocean issues. So, you know, they're essentially acting uh, as as ally would as allies would in many contexts, expanding the scope of the geo geographic theater 
at which they 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 share a view about a, a certain challenge and threat and making plans to address that. Right. Indrani, would you agree with that, that acting as allies, even if they're not formal allies, is that the level of confidence and trust there is now? I would, that level uh, of transformation? I would agree with Michael there, uh, because uh, honestly, the level of trust you can see by the quality of discussions that even happen on an every on a daily basis, um, and the level of trust. Uh, it it isn't with everybody that India do, is doing the kind of um, deals or the kind of agreements, the kind of work that it is with the U.S. and it. So we talk about America changing its its attitude to India, and it clearly has. Let's talk for a couple of minutes about India changing its attitude. Yeah, absolutely, also. we I should mean, look let's, at let's that. Let's remember the what was it? Uh, uh, civil nuclear deal. Oh yeah. It, it, it was almost derailed because India didn't want to be in that closer relationship with the United States. Even today, even in the last few years, there'd be a lot of people who would say, "Well, you know." China's not that bad, maybe we should try and talk to them and how bad could it really get? And it's really taken a, possibly a strategic misstep by China to really alienate India and to show India China can never be your friend. China can never be somebody whom you can work with. You better, yeah. you better, better figure out what you Yes, that well, uh, you, uh, I think we realized a while ago that you cannot actually work with China, that China is your biggest strategic challenge uh, with the US though I mean it's not if you look at the the, the, the deals that have come through it's not a one-sided uh, effort at all it is uh, it's India also doing India also investing India also uh, reaching out to the US and I think India has had to do a lot of work and has had to think differently about uh, doing uh, working with the US because you know you've seen uh, Trump earlier Biden now Presidents bo are saying that there should be more burden sharing. They, their traditional allies have cavilled, have complained. India has never complained. India has wanted to do more. India has been willing to take the yes. burden, take to, to shoulder the burden, yes. which is India's something which Americans should be happy absolutely. about. Absolutely. Mr. about changing attitudes. Are you noticing that? That by now, as you, you think those. I think the Prime Minister called it the hesitancies of the past. Is that behind us now in India? You Whatever. see, uh, you know, I, I've been closely following your conversation here. Uh, I think it's too early to speak about that. You know, uh, there is no evidence, at least uh, from the Indian pronouncements, at any level, you know, even in the run-up to the visit, you know, it's symptomatic of this sort of a trend. I think we are our policy makers. What about the Prime Minister saying natural allies? You look at the space, the statements. Well, he this made. was in 1998 that we used this expression for the first time. Okay. You know, there's a lot of rhetoric in this relationship which is uh, turned out to be hollow. We know that. You know, the point is not that. The point is this: that you know that uh, India is very well aware that this is a period of transition in the world order. When you mentioned, uh, for example, about uh, allowing India or empowering India in a way to be responsible for the regional security in a certain part of the world, nobody is in a position to apportion it today because there are other countries in the region. Indian Ocean itself, if you take, for example, there are many other countries and you know which are you know plowing their own path saudi arabia united arab emirates which is under sanctions american sanctions you speak about the gulf you know saudi arabia is an extremely strained relationship opec plus it, it itself shows iran turkey egypt all these are you know india's extended neighborhood so okay. when you when you look at all this you know you will find that i don't think our uh, decision makers are ignorant. I think they are extremely very well informed and uh, if you closely follow the statements of uh, external affairs minister, he is very well clued in. All right. Um, let, let me just get that broader question of sharing the burden and the challenges of security in the entire broader region. Arzan Tarapur is not joining us. South Asia Research Scholar Stanford University is actually in Taipei which is uh, interesting because that could well be one of the next places where uh, pe people are going to be sitting and figuring out what, to, what, what can be done. Um, Arzan, when you're looking at all that's happening between uh, India and the United States from the point of view of everyone else in Asia, everyone else in the world, if you're looking at this from the point of view of China, 
from the point of view of Taiwan, from the point of view of ASEAN, uh, Europe. How do you think what we've seen in the last couple of days is being seen and interpreted from a global point of view? So, I mean, everyone will have their own different points of view, right? So, obviously, how the state visit is being seen in Beijing is going to be quite different to how it's being seen uh, among other like-minded countries, like in Canberra, for example, um, or in New Delhi, obviously, uh, or even across Southeast Asia. I think the one of the key uh, aspects that we need to understand, with me sitting in Taiwan right now, is that what we've seen from the state visit is not about the US and India uh, preparing at an operational level to improve their sort of immediate short-term military interoperability. There's a lot of work that's happening on that, in that space continually, incrementally. There was a couple of announcements along those lines in the state visit as well, for example, with the posting of liaison officers to combatant commands. But I think the headline events of the state visit, the headline announceables of the state visit are not about that sort of uh, short-term contingency or crisis planning that, that is front of mind in many people uh, in the region, right? What it really is about is about uh, increasing India's capacity to effectively compete against China over the long term. So... You know, there was a, 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 a controversial and widely read article that Ashley Tellis wrote uh, last month where he said that the United States cannot count on India to rush to its side in the case of a US-China crisis or conflict. And he's right, unless Indian security interests are directly implicated. But I think the broader so question, I mean, I'm glad, I'm, I'm, it's interesting you referred to that particular article because that was, that was going to be sort of linked to my next question. Sitting there in Taiwan, for example, India is not a formal ally of the United States. So if something was to happen, if China was to invade, it's not necessary that India is going to be, is not treaty bound to rush to uh, America's defense or, or, or to Taiwan's defense for that matter. But to the extent that India is being able to protect its turf and tie up ex-securities or taking care of security in the Indian Ocean while others are focusing on the Pacific, it is adding to the overall uh, to international security in some sense. Is that the way it is being seen and interpreted in countries like Taiwan? Um, so to be frank, what I've been hearing in Taiwan is that uh, India's role in the type of crisis that is most worrisome to people in Taiwan, which is the type of military coercion or even over conventional attack on Taiwan. In such scenarios, India is going to be at best a marginal player militarily. My, uh, my interest, my, my research here is mostly about uh, the extent to which India can play, as you're alluding to, um, a role sort of on the margins of such a conflict and essentially in a non-military way. So when you talk about tying up uh, uh, Chinese attention elsewhere in other theatres, or when you talk about India playing a, a positive security role elsewhere, like in, in the Indian Ocean, that's all true, but that's not going to uh, affect seriously the outcome of coercion against Taiwan. What may matter more the type of role that India could play uh, okay. more meaningfully is in non-military uh, issues. Uh, and certainly the type of, of long-term capability development that the state visit is, is about uh, is the sort of thing that will make India a more attractive partner to Taiwan and a more attractive alternative to other countries across the region. Right, because I, I'm going to not try and get closing comments from everybody as, as, as we're running out of time, but... Uh, Ambassador Singh, defense is only one part of it. Um, the rise of India and the building of capabilities and the partnerships that we have seen being discussed over the last few days, it builds capability and capacity to solve other problems as well. I mean, climate change being the most obvious of them. How can you handle uh, you know, other issues around technology? How can you deal with AI? How can you make sure that China is not dominating supply chains, for example? Now, that's an area where Taiwan and and India might, might find, you know, shared ground in how do you make sure that semiconductors or rare earth isn't entirely controlled by China. So it, there's a lot of areas that can be worked together. 
Ambassador Singh? Yes, and also I think one aspect that is not getting enough attention is that there is value to the U.S. itself uh, from the India relationship. You know, for example, the U.S. has now invested more than $54 billion uh, U.S. companies in India. But Indian companies have invested more than $40 billion in the U.S. economy and have a presence across 50 states, uh, generating more than 400,000 jobs directly. And then there is indirect job creation impact. And then, you know, in many areas, while the IP is with the U.S. companies, cutting edge R&D and technology development work is being done by them using Indian human tech capital, both in U.S. and in India. So there is a value they get from the India partnership because as they are facing the challenge from China uh, and in many areas of the emerging technologies, China is said to be ahead of the US. Then a partnership with a country like India with 1.4 billion people and the amount of uh, technical human capital that India brings to the table uh, will be very, very uh, important for the US. So if you saw, for example, in the joint statement, aside from the kind of technology transfer that would happen to from the US or the investments that the US companies are they're doing, there was a specific reference to investments, $2 billion worth of investment, new investments that Indian companies are going to do in the US. Yeah. So this whole debate about whether America first and Atman Nibir Bharat would be in conflict, I think that argument has been addressed that both gain by coming together for this partnership uh, and uh, by building interlinkages of this kind. All right, uh, Mr. Madhav Kumar, let me try and get some final thoughts from you, wrapping up what we have seen in the last yeah, few days. Yeah, I think for a state visit, this turned out to be a very substantive visit. Definitely the relationship is going to be on a higher, uh, higher trajectory. There's no doubt about it. The quality of the relationship has changed. It is, it is deepened and it has become it is expanding. Uh, my only skepticism is about uh, jumping into conclusions at this stage in terms of the strategic dimensions of it. I think India is, uh, my own, my assessment is that India is playing its cards very close to its chess as it should be because there is so much volatility, there is so much of uncertainty in the international situation and uh, we are likely to get caught up in that in a way that can turn out to be very dangerous and risky for us. For example, we, we haven't touched on the Russia-China axis yeah. that is building up dramatically. And uh, now, you know, a two-front war is no longer of academic interest alone. It's a palpable reality, you know. So right. India, has, uh, uh, India has to weigh in all these matters. That is why I ex express skepticism about the trend of discussions we had on All that right. score. Yeah. Fair enough. Arz Arzan Tarapura, uh, let me just get your overall um, summing up, if you like, of, uh, of the state visit. Yeah, look, I mean, it was, as, as, as has been said already, it was obviously a very positive state visit. I would suggest it's the most uh, important uh, set of agreements that have emerged since the 2005 civil nuclear deal. Uh, it's not quite transformative on that level, but it's certainly the, the, the most important since then, precisely because it gets beyond the sort of transactional dialogues and arms transfers type of relationship that it used to be. It's now talking about changing the defence industrial base in the US and in India so that they can integrate better. So it's, a, it's, a, it's if, it, if there is follow through, if there is implementation, this will set a precedent for a new way of relating to each other uh, that, that we haven't seen yet. So in that sense, it's a very important right. inflection point. All right, Arzan. Indrani, you get the final words on this show. Um, well, I think uh, this was a visit that uh, took a lot of work on both sides, and I think both sides have delivered because there is a, there has been a level of strategic trust in each other. And that will be the building blocks for a new relationship um, that is much more equal than what we had been used to. We are putting behind the ghosts of technology denials and that is very important because all foreign policy is technology now. And the future is technology. 
So as long as you have these two countries working together on innovation, on technology um, in the future, pulling their weight almost equally, I mean, given the as asymmetry between the powers, I think this is a trajectory that will be very different. All right, that's a really interesting way of looking at it. Uh, if a lot of what is happening in the world is about technology, AI is coming, space, everything, it's all about technology. And if these two countries start working really closely together and in an integrated manner in technology, that partnership will build itself. But it's been a, it's been a remarkable visit, uh, as I started by saying, a symphony which in all reason has paid itself out really well, discordant note or not, it's paid itself out really, really well, and it will be remembered, I think, as a landmark visit. This was the India story. We'll be back next week.